Open my lips. Make haste, O oh God, to deliver me. Blessed be God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
blessed be God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. first of our readings this morning. It's taken from Isaiah in the 63rd chapter. I will mention the loving kindness of the Lord and the praises of the Lord according to all that the Lord has bestowed on us and the great goodness of the house of Israel which he has bestowed on them according to his mercies, according to the multitude of his loving kindnesses. For he said, surely they are my people, children who will not lie, so he became their savior. In all their affliction, he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them, and he bore them and carried them all the days of old. But they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. So he turned himself against them as an enemy, and he fought against them. Then he remembered the days of old, Moses and his people saying, where is he who brought them up out of the sea with the shepherd of his flock? Where is he who put his Holy Spirit within them, who led them by the right hand of Moses, with his glorious arm dividing the water before them, to make for himself an everlasting name, who led them through the deep as a horse in the wilderness, that they might not stumble? As a beast goes down into the valley, and the Spirit of the Lord causes him to rest, so you lead your people to make yourself a glorious name. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. Our epistle reading is from Galatians, the fourth chapter. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his Son into your heart, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks. And our gospel lesson this morning is from the Gospel of St. Matthew in the second chapter. Now, when they had departed... Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt, and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry. And he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and all its districts from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, A voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation, weeping, and great mourning. Rachel, weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted, because they are no more. Now when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who sought the young child's life are dead. Then he arose, took the young child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. When he heard that Archaeus was reigning over Judea instead of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Being warned by God in a dream, he turned aside into the region of Galilee. And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thank you. <coughs> Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly set in the heavens. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Glory. 
Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Grace and peace be to you in Christ Jesus. Amen. Our text is from the Gospel lesson, verse 16. Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry, and he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and all its districts, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. There ends the text. Your fellow redeemed... From the moment of Jesus' birth, the devil was after him. And the devil used weak and godless men to do his bidding. In this case, he uses Herod, who was a very willing accomplice in the whole thing. Herod wasn't afraid to kill hundreds of babies if he could protect his position as a puppet of the Roman Empire. Herod had access to the governmental records after the census. He knew where every baby was in his district. 
He knew their addresses. And he used that information to track down everyone he could and kill them. What horrible sounds must have filled that night. The sounds of soldiers shouting and breaking down doors. The sounds of parents screaming as their children were murdered in front of their eyes. I have no doubt that some parents probably were also killed in the process as they threw themselves between the soldiers and their babies. The air would have been filled with sounds of wailing and mourning for weeks after this. So quickly, after the high point of the miracle of God's grace, when God took on flesh and blood, came into our world to bear humanity's sins and to reconcile God with men, so soon after that fantastic miracle comes such an example of the depths of human depravity. What could be more sickening, more blatantly evil than killing all of these little babies? It's so satanic, we don't like to dwell on the idea at all, even though in our day we have our own modern equivalent of this, the murder of the infants through abortion. The violence and the ugliness of the murder of these babies by Herod is something we do have to look at and mark well in our minds. We have to notice here a pattern, a pattern that began with Herod and Christ and will continue on through time right into our day. And it's a very basic, very simple kind of pattern. Christ appears to bring God's salvation and the devil follows on his heels with violence to silence him. Wherever Christ's grace is proclaimed and the forgiveness of God is distributed, you can bet on it that the devil is going to be right behind in order to kill it. When Jesus grew into a man and went from town to town preaching this message of eternal life through him, the devil was always just a step behind, stirring up hearts against Christ. When Jesus came into Jerusalem, the devil's agents were waiting, and they grabbed him, and they did kill him. Even though Jesus broke no laws, didn't even teach rebellion against the government, he did nothing but proclaim the love and the forgiveness of God. And that was all it took for the devil to turn against him. See, the lesson here is that the devil cannot stand the message of Christ. Because he knows that message does exactly what God sends it to do. It takes men and women like you and me, people born in turns us into children of God. It purges the devil from us. This pattern, though, this pattern is something that continued on. After Jesus' death, when the disciples took the message of life from Christ into the surrounding cities, the devil was there, too, with his agents. And quickly, in every town where the disciples went, Death and violence sprung up against Christians to silence it. When Paul brought the message of Christ to Rome, the devil stirred up Nero against Christians. And he rounded them up and he murdered them too. In fact, just being known as a Christian was enough to get you arrested. And if you refused to forsake your faith in Christ and bow down to Caesar as your God, you were murdered in any number of of different horrific ways. The pattern of violence following the grace of Christ took a lot of Christian lives. We have to see the pattern. We have to let it burn into our mind and be prepared for it because that's not dead. It's a pattern still manifest that will come against us. The devil's never given up this tactic. Even in our more mature, civilized country, where religious speech and, and practice is supposedly protected by law, even there, 
the devil raises up violence against Christ and tries to silence him. In fact, my wife had an experience just before Christmas along these lines while she was substitute teaching. Walking down the hall with a group of children, they started singing a Christmas carol. It was Christmas. She was quickly told by a teacher's aide to be quiet because you can't sing about Christ and Christmas on Jesus' birthday. And I have no doubt that teacher's aide thought that she was protecting the sensibilities of those Christians or those children who weren't Christians, but unknowingly, she was an instrument of the devil, working to try and silence even the name of Christ during his birthday. In our world of extreme political correctness and toleration, every point of view is tolerated except that of Christ and his message of exclusive salvation through him alone. My friends, it is vital we see this for what it is. It's the hand of the devil. We are not wrestling flesh and blood, but principalities and powers. It fits a pattern we see in him all the way back to Herod and Jesus in Matthew's gospel today. Besides just recognizing the pattern and being prepared to face it ourselves, we should also mark how God deals with the pattern. He doesn't stop Herod from killing all those babies. And he didn't stop Nero from killing all those Christians. And he doesn't stop the political correctness of our day. In fact, God allows evil to take its best shot at Christ. And then God shows how his love and mercy perseveres through it all and survives and is not silenced. Despite all the acts of murder, Herod did not stop Jesus from doing exactly what God sent him to do. Jesus still grew up living among God's people right under the nose of Herod's son, he still taught the message of reconciliation and peace that he would establish between God and man through his own flesh and his own death on the cross. He still offered up his own life as that perfect sacrifice we needed to atone for our sins. And he still rose victorious over the devil. The devil couldn't stop Jesus from saving lost sinners like you and me. And in Paul's day, when, when Nero tried to stomp out Christianity, all he really succeeded in doing was spreading Christianity even more. Because Christians left Rome, and they took the gospel with them, and then they proclaimed Christ to those new places where they went. And those people believed and were saved. And even within Rome itself, Roman citizens watched the Christians be martyred and killed for their faith, and they were drawn to Christ through it. They saw those people were willing to die for something, and those people trusted that Christ was going to raise them from death, and that death wasn't the last word. Unbelievers heard the message of Christ's victory over death and were drawn to him, were baptized into the faith, and were saved. God and his grace isn't stopped by the devil's attacks. And in our day, when those who try to silence the word of Christ do their worst, and maybe even make our lives miserable and uncomfortable, we see God fulfilling the end of the pattern and still letting his name be heard and his grace and forgiveness received still accomplishing exactly what he sends his word to do. The more the devil rages, the more Christ's grace has its day and saves sinful people like you and me. The love of God is unstoppable. I think this particular element of the pattern is something that would do us well to notice every single day. The love of God has proven unstoppable in our lives. The one part of this pattern 
that we really haven't focused on that perhaps we should is that where Christ is proclaimed and rebellion and follows to silence, it isn't just a thing we see in the world around us, we have to confess. This is a thing we see within ourselves. There is a part of our flesh that pushes Christ away. A part where Christ proclaims his love into our lives and we silence it by our own acts of disobedience and rebellion against God. If only we could sit on the sidelines and point at the world around us and say how awful it is, everybody else silences Christ. But we can't, as we have. The pattern of resistance and violence is there in our flesh. How much misery it produces in our lives because we resist Christ and push him away. But the final part of the pattern manifests itself among us here in his church. God doesn't simply give up on us because our rebellion follows Christ's grace. Our Savior meets us. He meets us right in the middle of our fighting with him. He calls us here into his church where he washes our sins away in our baptism. Where he proclaims our sins forgiven in his word of absolution. Where he feeds us on his son's body and blood to nourish us and forgive us yet again. Despite our rebellion and resistance of him, despite even being agents of the devil at times, Christ speaks his life back into us and gives us his grace to restore us all over again. Our sins don't stop God's love and forgiveness. He is greater than our sin. When we look at the devil's pattern playing out, both in the world out there where it attacks Christ and even in our own hearts at times when in our weakness we give in, when we see the pattern, there might be a tendency among us to get discouraged and depressed because evil looks so strong. It's so intimidating. We might want to even back down our confession of Christ in the world for fear of what might happen to us if we're too blunt with what God says. We should never lose heart because the ultimate pattern shows us not just that the devil chases God's grace, but that God's grace always overcomes the devil's attacks. As he does it in the world around us, he does it within us. So today, we face the devil in the world and even in ourselves. We face his rebellion with confidence and trust in Christ to overcome it. You, my friends, are safe in your Savior's care. You are reconciled to God and redeemed, and the devil has lost his hold on you. Thanks be to Christ. Amen. Now may the peace that surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.
we continue with prayer, I'd like to invite the newly about to be installed officers forward, and the congregation may sit. Beloved in the Lord, Holy Scripture admonishes us that all things should be done decently and in order. To that end, the Constitution and bylaws of this congregation establishes various offices to which men are elected and appointed to serve. In so doing, the church follows the example of the early church as described in Acts chapter 6. The twelve summoned the full numbers of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good rep reputation, full of the spirit and wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. The apostle Peter writes in his first epistle, As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another, as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to him belong the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. You have been chosen to fill specific offices and positions of responsibility here at St. John Lutheran Church. You are to work with me, the pastor, that our life together in Christ may be orderly and pleasing in his sight. You are to see that the services of God's house are held at the proper time, that the word of God is preached purely and taught according to the Lutheran confessions, that the sacraments of Christ are administered according to his institution, that provision is made for the Christian instruction of young and old, that the erring are admonished, and that discipleship is maintained. You are to see that the temporal affairs of the congregation are properly administered, and that proper support is provided for the workers of this congregation. You are to assist in caring for the poor and sick, in cultivating harmony among members, in promoting the general welfare of the congregation, and in furthering the kingdom of Christ here and throughout the world. While holiness of life and obedience to Christ are expected of all members of the congregation, it is especially important that you, as office bearers in his church, Show yourselves by word and example to be faithful to him and in service and Christian devotion. In the presence of God and this congregation, I therefore ask you, do you accept the offices entrusted to you? And do you promise faithfully to carry out your duties, trusting in the Lord and conforming yourself to his word in accordance with the faith of the Evangelical Lutheran Church? If so, answer, I do. And beloved in the Lord, you have heard the promises of these faithful men spoken, whom you have elected to serve as officers of our congregation. Do you as a congregation promise to support them in their work, to remember them in your prayers, and to work with them to the best of the abilities that God has given you, so that he may be glorified and his work be done in our midst? If so, then answer, we do. And brothers in Christ, I install you as officers of St. John's Lutheran Church in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Almighty and merciful God, enlighten and strengthen you in your offices, that you may be good and faithful stewards to the glory of his name and the good of his people. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we give thanks that you have raised up these servants for work among your people. We humbly implore you to grant them your Holy Spirit and those gifts needed for the faithful carrying out of their tasks, most especially wisdom, strength, and willing hearts. Let your blessing rest upon this congregation. Strengthen the faith, quicken the love, and enkindle the zeal of its members 
that your name may be glorified, and that here and in all places under heaven the kingdom of your Son may be advanced. We remember with thanksgiving those who have faithfully served your people and have now completed their time of service. We pray that in the end of days, we with all your faithful people may hear the voice of Christ saying, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Go in the name of the Lord, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. The Almighty and most merciful God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless and preserve you. Amen. The congregation may rise. We continue with the Lord's Prayer on page 227. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have safely brought us to the beginning of this day. Defend us in the same with your mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings, being ordered by your governance, may be righteous in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Let us bless the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. 